Part 8. End. Two things everyone knew. You couldn't outwit the Tomor, and every contract had a loophole. If only you looked hard enough. Ever since the first people were permitted to visit the past, they'd tried to cheat. To win the lottery, commit murder, or prevent it. And every time, coincidence somehow conspired to ruin the plan. Every single time. But what if someone could go back, for a genuine reason, but make some tiny, insignificant change in the past, calculated to snowball into the present? People kept trying. At a quarter to midnight, in a deserted park, a crackle of static briefly sounded, and behind a bush there was a man who hadn't been there before. Aged sixty, dressed in faded army surplus camouflage, with a grey crew cut and rimless spectacles. Miller stepped out, and, barely looking around, made for the convenience store opposite. In the brightly lit shop, he slowed, taking a basket and examining the shelves carefully. Three loaves of sliced bread with packets of butter were chosen. Then several types of cheese and tinned meat went into the basket on his arm. There was one other customer, a shambling elderly man with a hood over his head, looking down at the floor. Miller picked out some vegetables, a packet of breakfast cereal and a large carton of milk. Then some chewing gum and a six-pack of beer. Finally, a plastic bottle of painkillers the only one on the shelf. He scanned the items at the self-service machine while the old man waited behind, then paid in paper cash and carried the bulging plastic bags out into the night. Miller walked back across the road and back into the park, following the bicycle path. Stopping at a bench behind a row of trees, he carefully set down the pill bottle next to a waste bin. For one trip into the past, everyone paid one-fifth of what they owned. Miller had owned a small caravan, less than two hundred dollars, and a dozen bottles of cheap cider. One-fifth of almost nothing is still almost nothing. Five minutes out of the park, and he was standing outside a room in a youth hostel, hesitating before knocking. Inside was himself, aged twenty, a starving dropout, about to receive an email from a stranger with a get-rich-quick scheme. The young Miller needed two things, a good meal and some good advice. The older man knocked. Half past midnight, and a mile from the park, a woman appeared. Dressed in a nondescript second-hand trouser suit, Larson was in her late twenties, the very image of an efficient secretary or a fussy librarian. Sent back a year after Miller and by a different company, she stood for over a minute in the gathering rain, alone and lost in thought. Then she seemed to reach a decision and set off in the direction of a nearby housing estate. Three identical grey apartment blocks, with a small garden and children's play area between them. Larson huddled against the rain as she pressed the buzzer of one, spoke into the grill, and sprinted through the doorway. Behind the door of apartment 76 was Larson's mother, living alone with terminal cancer. Mother and daughter hadn't spoken for nearly a year. They were not exactly estranged, but somehow there was always a pressing reason to delay calling. The first time, Larson's mother had died quietly a week from now, and it had been nearly a month before she was found and Larson informed. This time, the younger woman just wanted to say goodbye before it was too late. Goodbye, and a few other things that seemed important. She knocked. It doesn't take long to say things you've rehearsed for ten years. So, thirty-five minutes later, Larson left, with a slight smile but sad eyes, her mother already asleep in bed. There was also an unopened glass bottle from the apartment in her pocket. Her mother had stopped taking the medication months earlier, saying it made her feel worse. The rain had stopped, and Larson walked quickly over the shiny macadam out into the park, where she found a bench and sat, setting the bottle on the ground. She stayed there for another fifteen minutes, hands clasped, staring at nothing, lost in thought. When the hour expired, there was a brief stab of static, and she vanished. Curtis found the bottles easily. They hadn't told him much, but it wasn't hard to work it out. 
All he had to do was pay his own money and go back for his own reasons, stopping off to do them a small, insignificant favor. And when he got back, they'd transfer 500 times what he'd paid into his bank account. Easy money. That's what they'd said. Obviously, others had been sent back to the same place, or would be sent back, months or years away, to perform their little piece of the jigsaw. Obviously, the Tomor were able to spot one person breaking their unknowable rules, but there had to be some threshold of significance, some way to fly under the radar. It took over a minute to open the bottles, fumbling at the seals with plump fingers. He took care not to spill any while transposing the contents, then emerging from the park with a painkiller bottle in his pocket. He crossed the road and headed directly for the late night store. No one could miss Curtis, but no one ever looked at him twice. Well over six foot, a battered old raincoat wrapped around his bulbous frame, raindrops collected on his combed over pate. He passed the medicine section, stopping to read some labels, and moved on, leaving behind a single plastic bottle alone on its shelf. Having bought a packet of cigarettes and a lighter, Curtis walked the winding streets for ten minutes, before stopping at one nondescript house in a row of interchangeable nondescript houses. He took something out of his pocket, a silver engagement ring, and knocked sharply on the door. Ten years earlier, he'd bought the ring, studded with diamonds with two names engraved on the inside. Ten years ago, he'd been hopelessly in love with a girl who was everything he'd ever wanted, and ever wanted to be. A young woman who wanted to spend the rest of her life with him, for reasons he could never understand. She had loved the gangling, chubby geek, with his receding hairline and vague, awkward dreams. She had already booked the honeymoon, and he had broken it off. One week from now, the young Curtis would take back the ring and walk away. Another week, and the girl tried to kill herself. She failed, but the damage to her heart and liver couldn't be repaired. Now, all the older Curtis had to do was warn her. He had the ring as proof, a packet of her favorite cigarettes, and one chance to put it all right. Not for him, for her. The bottle was purchased later that night by a middle-aged woman. She was a journalist, investigating allegations of corruption and a political connection. The next day she had a migraine and was later found dead, apparently of a prescription narcotic overdose. So she never wrote the story, and a legal case against twelve businessmen collapsed. The young Miller pondered his two visitors of the night, and the four big bags of food they'd brought him between them. The sixty-year-old veteran who'd come to warn him not to fall for an internet scam, and the eighty-year-old in the hooded jacket, who'd come to ask a favor. Different, but the same. Miller deleted the email, put on his coat, and went out to the park. The bench was where he'd been told, and the two unopened bottles underneath. He unscrewed both, and emptied their contents out into the waste bin. Every contract has a loophole. 